He was a good man. Difficult man and a good man. He was always so grateful and never took anything for granted. He was a deeply honourable human being. My father was born in Poland in September 1922 um, and it was only four years after Poland had regained its independence. Where he was born was in a, a little farm um, in a place called Machkovsi near the cities of Lviv um, and Lutsk um, in what's now western Ukraine. Akurat zakładana była osada, bo mój ojciec był legionistą i za swoje wyczyny dostał działkę. No więc on był pierwszy, który się urodził z rodziny. Potem jeszcze przyszły dwie siostry. Ja jestem najmłodsza. So he grew up and was born into a, an area which was trying to rediscover itself in a way after the First World War. And dad's family, particularly on his father's side, but also on his mother's side, had been very much in favour of trying to regain Poland's independence. Brat skończył szkołę powszechną i ojciec go wysłał do gimnazjum państwowego w Łódzku. Na święta przyjechał ze świadectwem. No, na świadectwie była niestety dwuja z języka ukraińskiego. Ojciec był w Szokowany, jak to ty się uczysz ukraińskiego, tak? I to jest przemusowy, i ja nie będę się uczyć tego języka, dlatego że powiedziałem im, że tatuś walczył o wolność Polski, no i po ukraińsku nie będzie mówić. Dad grew up in this patriotic household, which saw things very much from a I would say a progressive, enlightened, but very Polish perspective. So they were all in favour of the multicultural nature of Poland and friendship with Ukrainian people, with Lithuanians, with Czechs who were in the area, Slovaks were in the area, um, and with the Jewish population, but always from a perspective of this is Poland, which of course makes all the difference. In the roku naturalnie wybuchła wojna. Do nas, nas przyjech, przyszli ci Rosjanie, ale zanim doszli do nas, jeden Żyd podszedł do mego ojca i mówi, panie Stepek, pan musi uciekać, bo pan jest na liście do zamordowania. Na drugi dzień przyszedł Ukrainiec z dwoma pistoletami i mówi, panie Stepek, ja pana przeprowadzę przez granicę, bo pan nie zna języka. A ja sobie dam rady. No i udało im się. The following month though, um, so that was January 1940, the following month was a, a mass campaign of deportation. And um, the evening of the 9th of February, they were told to stay at home, to pack their um, belongings, some belongings, because they would be asked to do labour for the Soviet um, war effort and the Soviet economy, and so they did so. And the following morning, um, two o'clock in the morning, they were woken up, um, gunpoint, and told they'd half an hour, get everything together, be in the cart, and follow the others and go to the nearest train station. And so they did that, but one Russian um, soldier said to them, um, take as much as you can, and um, take warm clothing, you know, so he was trying to help 
which again for me is a an incredibly emotional um, and poignant act of compassion. And then they were taken um, to what is commonly called in Poland Siberia. And it's not actually Siberia where they were taken, it's northern Russia in Archangel region. It took three weeks, so from the 10th of February to I think it was the 1st of March. The locals said to them um, in a kindly fashion, you know, here you are, here you'll stay. I mean, he said that to me, he said that right from day one, he said he was going to survive. And when people told him, you know, they were all going to die in Siberia, um, he said, I never believed it for a minute. So he was told that he was going to be cutting down the logs and that was one of the dreaded jobs. Um, and he said, I'm trained as a joiner, a carpenter, which he wasn't. And so that's what he did. And he very, very rapidly learned to be a good joiner because he had about a week's grace and there were targets. And he, had, he learned from a book, I think, at school um, about Thomas Edison. And um, he had been told that if you split your labour, if you made a whole lot of stools, chairs, uh, sorry, the seats for the chairs, and you made a whole lot of legs afterwards, that eventually that would end up making more than if you tried to make a stool, then another stool, then another stool. And so for the first few days that meant he went hungry because you were paid with food for what you made each day. But at the end of the week, he had so many more stools, according to Dad, than anybody else. And he got given bonus of food and a few rubles. And so that was, a, again, that ingenuity and, and that confidence in himself that he could do without food and still come out right, you know. And so it was early September that the family were told that they were free to go, um, September 1941. And Dank at this point had pneumonia. So the family were saying, oh, what do we do? Do we stay? Also, how do you get to Kazakhstan from near the Arctic Circle? You know, it's not like you could get a train ticket and, you know, just take the train down. So they made the decision that they would try and get down before winter fully set in. And they, they left... Um, in September 1941. Ural, dlatego, że już Niemcy tam byli. On the 6th of December 1941, um, St. Nicholas's Day, um, Danka told me the story that they were in a siding like that and a Russian civilian train drew up alongside them and they were also stuck because train, other trains going in different directions and so all the Poles went out and begged because by this time they were really, really uh, fearful of starvation and Danka was left to stay with her mother while Zosha and, and my dad, Jan, um, went out begging and they came back with nothing and then Danka heard a word, uh, and it meant little girl. And Danka looked up, and it was from the other train, and it was a, a Russian woman shouting, Dvochka, little girl. And Danka looked again, and the woman bent down and threw something across the track to Danka. And Danka caught it, and it was a huge loaf of bread. And they hadn't eaten for four days by this time. And Danka looked up to, to say thank you to the lady, and the lady was gone. And so there's another unknown person to whom I owe my life and they owe their lives and we'll never know who she was or what happened to her.
and that's all they were told, go to Kazakhstan, you know? So the, all these villages and collective farms had thousands upon thousands of refugees converging on them. Of course, the locals then, that meant the locals had to share what little they had. And so some gave and some were angry um, at being in the imposition of these hungry, starving foreigners. Um, but Danka remembers and Dad remembers people giving them, you know, little pancakes or soup. Um, my dad then found that the Polish troops were nearby and he could go and recruit with the Polish army. But that meant leaving his family, so it was his mother who said, go, whatever happens to us happens. And he never saw her again. So that was a major life decision. Dad was 19 at the time. Um, and so Dad joined the Polish um, army at Kermine in Kazakhstan and immediately fell ill with typhus. And so when they left across the Caspian Sea, Dad was with about another 80 to 100 typhus sufferers um, and who joined the army under the care of a doctor. He said his, his bed position was put beside the morgue because they expected that's where he was going. Unknown to him, um, his two sisters and his mother had also been taken to um, Tehran, the two girls together, um, both seriously ill, and his mother in another hospital, unknown to the girls as well. So now the family were in three different um, places, all in the same city, all in hospitals. And Danka got well enough and found out that where my dad was and went to visit him. Um, but this time he had to bring the news that his mother had died. Um, she was 40. And the official explanation was starvation and exhaustion. So he was officially enlisted in the Polish Na army again on the 1st of March 1943 and on the 10th of March he was in the Navy. So that was the actual dates if I remember rightly in his military records. Joined the Polish Navy and um, was trained in radar and that was a big breakthrough for Dad. He was enlisted in the Polish Navy and then was in the war. And that was in the Krakowiak initially, um, which saw action, liberation of the Greek islands, the Dodecanese islands, um, then Sicily, then up the coast of Italy. They were shelling, they were, it was a destroyer. So it was shelling the enemy troops from the sea um, and engaging with the enemy warships. And so when Monte Cassino, the famous Polish um, engagement there, the, my dad's ship was off that coast, shelling. Then they had to go back, um, and that's when something miraculous happened, um, where he bumped into his two sisters, um, they were reloading for supplies in Haifa, in present-day Israel, then part of Palestine. And they were given shore leave while that was happening. Bumped into some Polish girls there, and Dad's only 21, 22 at the time, so you get chatting away, and how did you get here? And they said, well, we came via Siberia, via Persia. And Dad was saying, yep, this happened to my sisters as well. I don't know if they're alive, they were seriously ill. Um, my mother died, I don't know what's happened to my dad. And the girls said, what's your name? Yannick Stepik. And Stepik, we've got two Stepiks in our school here. Dad was given shore leave to go and see if it was them and found his sister Zosha. And she was well enough to take him to the hospital, the dormitory, where Danka was ill again. And they were reunited. Myśmy z bratem byli jak bliźniaki. Myśmy się tak dobrze rozumieli, jak byliśmy dziećmi. Brat zawsze mnie brał wszędzie. Właziliśmy na drzewo na jednej gałęzi i spadaliśmy z tygra. Na wiosnę szliśmy na dół. Tam taki potok się tworzył, ale 
tego. Było to za, 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 zaciepiało bajory, myśmy tu odsuwali, przychodziliśmy brudni, ale z bratem wszędzie byliśmy. Dad took part in the Normandy landings. Um, he was involved in saving um, a lot of lives of ships that were destroyed and people literally swimming to the nearest ship and sort of pulling them up um, on ropes. Um, and he remembers um, enemy people being shelled and screaming. And he, he said at that point he realised that you may be fighting an enemy, but these were human beings. And uh, he said at that stage, any sense of revenge just left him. Um, Yesterday morning at 2.41 a.m., General Jodl, the representative of the German High Command and of Grand Admiral Dönitz, the designated head of the German state, signed the act of unconditional surrender of all German land, sea and air forces in Europe to the Allied Expeditionary Force. Then the war ended and the big question was, what do you do now? Um, for Dad and his family, um, who were still in touch there for, through the war, and as the war ended they were now allowed more open communication. They decided very quickly that they won't go back too dangerous, they were warned not to come home. And then the question was, well, we're now refugees. And the British government reluctantly um, allowed the Poles to, to stay, to try to encourage them to go back, um, but allowed those, those who, who were unwilling to, to stay. And Dad was given the opportunity to study. And um, he found that there, was, there were grants for study and that was allowed to Poles. And that one place that you could study was what's now the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Then um, the Royal College of Technology, which is a sub name of the Radio and Television College. And because Dad had a background now in radar, having to repair radars, he knew about electronic equipment. And Dad thought, I'll go and take that grant. And he knew about Scotland only for 10 days or so in training, but he knew where it was and he took a train up to Glasgow um, and all he had was his suit and permission um, and a Polish passport, a hand done passport, um, saying who he was. At that time, very luckily for him, um, 1947, he met my mum. Um, so dad meeting mum was a, a great pairing of a very patient, gentle but practical young woman um, and this dynamic energetic young man determined that he was going to have a successful life despite what had happened to him or maybe because of what had happened to him um, and he grabbed it and seized it and so very quickly I mean they were married in 1949 um, 26th of February and very quickly had agreed by that time that they would go into business together. I think primarily because he wasn't very good at doing what he was told by other people. <laughs> And he says that himself. He said, "I'm a bit, I'm a bit terrible employee." You know, I was, I, you know, yeah, I could do the job, and I was good. At, I had my own ideas, you know, and I was very impatient to see them go into practice. He was a really good businessman. He had a flair, but saying that, maybe this is something you know. I mean, they started off in a room and kitchen. Yes, and Teresa bathed the children at the sink while John was repairing things. That's, my husband was an, an electrician as well. So they both repaired things. They both worked to get a business going. They weren't handed any money. My earliest memory of, of Dad is, if I think about it, is, I'm sit, is, is out in the little hallway of the tenement flat that we lived in. We were on the ground floor. As you walked in the door, there was, he'd set up in this very tiny, na narrow hallway, um, a bench where he could work on his radios. He did a lot of work, most of the work at home. He didn't have any other premises at the time. And you would walk through that door and he would be there working away, you know, for all hours. And uh, the one thing I remember my mum saying sort of so clearly, it's still in my head, is don't touch anything in your father's bench. <laughs> and 
he knew if even the slightest thing had been moved. Um, it's actually very like my older brother. You know, they've got a neat and orderly way of putting things, and um, <laughs> it doesn't work out that way. Then they know. <laughs> and mum and dad slept in the sort of what you call a recess bed mm -hmm. in the sitting room, um, and it, it was the kitchen and the sitting room as well, all in one. Just uh, no hot water outside toilet we shared with other people in the flats, and. Uh, just one bedroom at the front of the, the flat, and that was where the three children slept. Mm. And all sort of piled in together. And he would go in the bus to the person's house, pick up the radio, and the radio was about the size of a, this, this chair, and um, take it in the bus, repair it, and he charged one price, regardless of the parts and the labour, so that it would be affordable to people. And he thought, He's got the energy to do enough repairs to make that work. And he knew what the parts would be and he, he always haggled for parts anyway. So I think it was like 10 shillings, 50 pence, um, a repair, one price, I'll repair it. If it doesn't work, I'll repair it again for nothing. And so he gained this reputation as being this young, strange, young Polish man in canvas lying who was brilliant at repairing things. And if he said it would happen by such and such a time, it would happen and that reputation for integrity and, and, and directness. And the business just flourished. Um, he was having spare parts. They, they lived in a room and kitchen, which was two rooms, one room, one kitchen. And by the time 1955 came, they'd been doing this for five, six years. And they were also then putting up TV aerials. And they were making a small fortune from this, this hands-on practical work. And my dad said he was never so cash rich in his life in those early days. But he had three children now by this time and he was still repairing radios in a house with which had one bedroom and one kitchen and he was repairing radios and all these parts lying about everywhere. So that was impractical and they came up with the idea of opening shops. Um, TV, 1953 the Queen was crowned and that was the big pivotal year of people saying let's buy a TV for you know the, the coronation. He became very well known in the trade um, we eventually ended up, the family business was, I think, the third largest um, independent business of its type in Britain and the biggest in Scotland. And so he would go down to London, do talks about sort of building a business. He, when the Japanese manufacturers started coming to Europe, they first came to Britain and they came to our head office in Hamilton about 1970, 71, 72, those years. Toshiba, Panasonic, Samsung, all these massive global names. They were completely unknown then in, 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 in Europe. And they came, and of maybe five or six people in Europe they came to, they came to my dad and they asked him, how do we come into this market? And they were asking him advice. You know, it's staggering to think of now. Um, so dad just blossomed and he loved it. Rent an automatic washing machine for only $3.49 a week or a fridge freezer only $3.29 a week at Glenn's, Hutchison, Robertson's and Stepek. Rent the superb large screen TV plus this fabulous full feature video plus this superb MIDI Hi-Fi all for under £20 a month. It's another great rental deal from Glenn's, Hutchison, Robertson's and Stepek. All together better. The downside of that was that Dad, for maybe about five, six, seven years, became pretty arrogant and overconfident, cocky, think he could do no wrong, which was almost the case. But he became not just a disciplinarian, which was all right as a father, but a kind of I know everything. He was a wee punk. He was a small, because I am tall, and because he was small and he was quite an arrogant little man, he was. Yeah, I cared about him and I got very fond of him. But he was an arrogant wee man. And my mum hated that. She was very humble, modest, didn't like showiness. And by this time my dad had bought two Rolls Royces, a Triumph Stag at the same time, you know. And we all hated it. I mean, we all hated it. When we drove, we were driven to school or something, um, given a lift by my dad, we would sink down in the chair so that nobody would see us in a Rolls Royce. Because it obviously had all of us, he put a plank of wood mm -hmm. in the back of it 
so that he could get more of us in. So it was like almost like the way a taxi is in the back. So we'd all sit in this, and it wasn't polished, we'd let me tell you. <laughs> So we had benches. The only family in the world I think we had benches in the back seat of a Rolls Royce, a classic Rolls Royce. Uh, I don't wish you said we know we all we all piled in to go to the mass on Sunday, um, and people would gawk. It's this beautiful Rolls Royce, you know, sort of pulled up outside the church, and people would, they would laugh as we all got out because it was like one of those sort of you know how many people can you pack in? <laughs> you all came sort of tumbling out one after another. I think people look and see if there are any more. <laughs> In 1969, um, Dad was approached by the direct, some of the directors at Hamilton Ackies, um, which was a major part of his, his later life. The club fell on troubled times in the late 1960s and Jan was one of four local businessmen that came in to get involved with Hamilton Ackies and, and try and rescue them with some financial resources. And Jan uh, came on board as chairman in 1969, a position he held until 1987 when he stepped down, uh, when he was 65, just before his 65th birthday. <laughs> in the summer of 2000 uh, to oversee the move to the new stadium that we're in here just now in Hamilton and he remained um, as chairman on the board until late 2002 when he stepped down for a second time. It's important to, to football itself but probably even more important to local people. They have something worthwhile to focus on. Every tribe has its mascot. And having come on board he came in with some innovative ideas which were not just a first in Scotland, but a first in Great Britain at that time. Uh, in 1971, we became the first club to have Eastern European footballers. Jan Stepe miał ze względu na kontakty handlowe z Polską dobre dotarcie do władz sportowych zarówno Polskiego Komitetu Olimpijskiego, jak i Górnika Zabrze i udało się sprowadzić właśnie do Szkocji e, e, trzech polskich piłkarzy, Romana Szczałkowskiego, Alfreda Olka i Witolda so they were, they were high level for Polish football players uh, but now retiring from international football and it was on that basis that they were granted visas to enter the UK to work. There were of course many rumours as to how Jan managed to secure these visas which was unheard of at that time and say we were the first club uh, to secure East European footballers uh, certainly in, in the UK if not Western Europe and there were rumours of umpteen uh, reconditioned washing machines heading in the other direction towards uh, various towns in Poland as uh, you know, a part gift towards uh, facilitating these players coming here. I think he loved that club. I don't think he loved football, I don't think he loved sport. I think he just loved the challenge of making something with with very limited resources work beyond its capabilities and he did that oh he did want to support hamilton because he had got his living from hamilton in that area oh yes and he wanted to do that but he liked the bit that the chairman was jan stepik and it was i remember dad almost every day almost every day after work saying to my mum in his Polish accent going to park and that meant it was going to Aki Stadium and he rolled the grass he cut the grass he painted the walls um, he would take some liberties he was very a very keen golfer and there are many stories of the players coming to train at our old ground in the morning uh, to find various golf balls scattered across the pitch particularly at the far penalty box that's because Jan would frequently come in the Sunday afternoon, stand at the back of the terracing and start, you know, teeing off and playing shots down the park, practicing his drives. Um... And he became a, a reasonably high-level golf player and he won a lot of tournaments, amateur tournaments. Um, and how he did this and run a football club and run a business, you know, it was a, a remarkable testimony to his, to his energy levels. He's, I never saw Dad tired, um, and he said he was never challenged, which is a remarkable thing. He was a strict father, as we, as we started to grow a bit older, he was strict. Um, never really, to me, I have to say, um, he was, um, I think just his presence <laughs> was enough to keep us in, under control. Mm. When he was at work, um, I think when we were at home, we just ran riots around the house. I don't know what Martin said, it's really, his dad was rotten with names, as I am too. 
Uh, but having ten children, that's quite a difficult thing to have to cope with. So he would sort of go through about half a dozen names before he got the right one. Uh, well, Martin said that he dubbed us all useless one, two, three, four, five. Because we were all a sad disappointment to him in the practical stakes. You know, we went, apart from my brother Jimmy, um, who is, is very practical, some of the others I've learned since, you could never ever do anything to his standards. You know, it was always bloody useless. <laughs> but we, 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 we learned just to, to accept and honour our uselessness. <laughs> It didn't, didn't make us feel any the, the, the worse or the less for it. That's funny, didn't me. The society was formed in 1954 and um, it was formed by people who found themselves here after the Second World War and wanted to f have a focus for the Polish community in Glasgow. Um, the club did find itself in very unusual circumstances um, at one point where our current account had in fact been, been frozen and we found ourselves uh, without a fund to carry on our day-to-day -day business. And Jan Stepek was very quick to step in and gave the club a substantial loan of money uh, to allow the club to carry on its, its function. And without that, we would certainly have been in very difficult trouble. Um, so everybody was extremely grateful. And he saw the club through that very difficult time to a successful uh, conclusion. Ja miałem e, przyjemność spotykać Jana w wielu e, okolicznościach, zarówno formalnych i nieformalnych. I wszędzie, kiedy byliśmy razem, widziałem olbrzymi szacunek jego kolegów, e, mieszkańców Szkocji, rodowitych Szkotów. Czy to było na polu golfowym, bo Jan Stepek, mimo że późno zabrał się za naukę golfa, bo po 50, był świetnym graczem, był e, nawet w swojej kategorii wiekowej mistrzem seniorów w Szkocji, czy to też przy okazji oficjalnych spotkań z politykami, z władzami samorządowymi. Wszędzie, naprawdę wszędzie widać było to uznanie, jakim darzony był Jan Stepek. A kind man and he would have done anything for anybody that needed it. But if he didn't need it, you wouldn't get it. He didn't suffer fools, gladly. When um, they moved to Hamilton um, and they had the shop, there was a homeless unit in Hamilton and a lot of them would go, must have gone round the shops asking for help. On się zawsze litował nad biednymi ludźmi. Zawsze wysyłał, jak ktoś przyszedł do sklepu czy coś takiego i był głodny czy coś, wysyłał do żony domu. Idź, on cię, ona cię nakarmi. And then one gentleman um, came and lived with us for, I don't know how, it seemed like years to me, it might not have been as long, it might have been a year or something like that. Um, I think it was, he was homeless and um, he had a learning disability and um, my mum and dad took him in. Um, Davy Jones was his name. And um, so he, he was just became like part of the family, <laughs> just like that. And he does what my father had experienced near starvation. He knew what it is to know, have nowhere to rest your head. Um, you know what it was is to worry about where the next piece of food was coming from. So, some people, by those experiences, are turned cold and they don't want to ever be anywhere near that again. Dad was different. Dad wouldn't tolerate it. And he gave to charities as well. But he wanted to be, he was by nature a hands on, practical man. So if he could give a roof over the head, over, over, over someone's head, then he did it. I remember being at home as a student, watching the TV, watching the news with Dad. Um, on two occasions that were really very powerful to me. Um, it was when Pope John Paul II was elected that evening and it came in the news. And I remember Dad saying to me and looking to me and saying, Martin, this changes everything. You know, that's really powerful. You know, I was probably 17, 18 at the time. I thought, oh, right. Because Dad didn't make statements like this, you know. Um, the other one was when martial law um, was declared and... Um, I just saw Dad's face and it was so serious, 
During the martial law when we had, there was a committee formed in Glasgow called Polish Aid, Scottish Aid for Poland. And Mr. Stefik was very much involved in that with the law professor Michael Kelly then. And he was very much involved with that, looking for, for, for uh, gifts or medicine, which, which we, we, went to, we went by tears to Poland. I passed with one of the first tears to Poland, to Warsaw, Gdańsk and Kraków. And when martial law came, I think Dad was reflecting on what could he do to try and show that Poland still existed in a free way, um, despite martial law. And so when the university had declared that they were going to close down and shut the, um, the studies department at Glasgow University, Dad stepped in and um, the business funded it. Jan Stepek uh, supported a lot of activities that were not only academic but were also open to a wider public. As a result of Jan Stepek's support, um, what was possible was to organize a conference on Cyprian Kamil Norwid. The second conference was on the Renaissance poet Jan Kochanowski. And the third one in, uh, in an organized series was devoted to interwar Polish literature. Jan Stepek bardzo, ale to bardzo angażował się w promocję Polski. E, ufundował e, coroczny wykład poświęcony Polsce na Uniwer University of Strathclyde. To jest drugi z uniwersytetów Glasgow, e, bardziej o profilu technicznym i co roku w latach 90. i później odbywała się wielka sesja poświęcona Polsce, na którą zapraszany był specjalny gość. I gościli między innymi na tej sesji z wykładami profesor Leszek Barcelowicz, minister Andrzej Olechowski, dr Henryk Zamoyski, profesor Jan Limon, również na przykład Neil Asherson. I Jan Stepek naprawdę przykładał wielką wagę do tego, aby Szkoci poznali Polskę i Polaków nie tylko jako bardzo często ubogich emigrantów, ale również jako przedstawicieli narodu o tysiącletniej tradycji z wielkimi osiągnięciami w różnych dziedzinach. Nawiasem mówiąc, oba te uniwersytety, zarówno Glasgow University, jak i Strathclyde University, nadały panu Janowi Stepkowi tytuł doktora honoris causa, a jedna z sal wykładowych na Glasgow University nosi imię Jana Stepka. Mamy tam Jan Stepek Hall. And he was incredibly grateful to Scotland for giving him refuge. Incredibly grateful. So a lot of what he did was really giving back what he saw he received and he was unstinting in his praise for Scotland on the way they'd accepted him. This, you know, we immigrant um, from Poland who you know, could barely speak any of the language when he arrived and they, they tolerated, not only tolerated, but they helped him. You know, and they accepted him and my mother's family accepted him and two, two pennies to rub together. Um, he had absolutely nothing but the clothes on his back and his demob money when he got here. Um, so a lot of it was about contributing. And he was very strong in that with all of us, that we should always try to contribute in some way um, to the society we were lived in. And they were always very brave. The only time I ever saw my father fearful was I was just quite a little girl, maybe about six or seven. And he was driving home and I think he picked me up from school or something. When he remembered, he frequently forgot me. Uh, he was stopped by the police because he drove like a bat out of hell. And they warned him. My father, as they approached in uniform, turned chalk white and stuck, you could see his hands shaking. And I'm absolutely certain, didn't realise at the time, but looking back on it now, he was having flashbacks to the NKVD, you know, him with uniforms and he just, but he, yeah, he was, he was frightened. He was very frightened. That's the only time I've ever seen him afraid. But then in 2000, 2001, both those years he had strokes, um, but this time he was coming up for 80 and it knocked him. He fought back against it. I remember him 
not been able to walk properly, not been able to talk properly, and he got back to both. He got back to playing golf, got back to playing golf, two rounds of golf a day, you know, after two strokes. And, but slowly but surely, other strokes and other little things were happening, and he was being chopped down. For a man who had been so active, um, my dad could tackle anything. Um, you know, whether it was building work or um, gardening or um, all, all his business as well, you know, which was a huge part of his life. Um, and then to go to someone who really became reliant on everyone else, it must have been very difficult, but he never complained, not once. And then he died. Um, it was a shock. <laughs> you know, he was he was very unwell. Um, Ninety years old. He just celebrated his ninetieth birthday. We had some terrible news about my mum that that year that my mum had cancer. Um, my mum just said very, very, very gently. Said, "Is it peace now?" Can you give me five minutes? And we were all out, crowded in this small room in the hospital. And we all went out and Danka turned round to go out and my mum just took her arm and said, not you. Four days after the funeral, mum had a stroke, um, went into a semi-coma, taken to a hospital here in Myers again, and she died within four weeks of dad dying. And at that time, for us as our kids, and this is now November, you know, this is a few weeks before Christmas, it was in one sense shattering. We didn't have time to grieve for Dad because Mum was so unwell straight away. Um, and, but in retrospect, it was the best thing for them to go together. Um, He worked entirely by instinct, entirely by instinct. And this was part of it. The kindness and the giving and the caring was as instinctive as his, the way he did business. And, and was, he was in full flight at his peak. He was an awesome figure to behold. Um, incredibly charismatic, very charming, very gracious, but my God, was he tough. He had a lot of faults. He was too impetuous, too impatient, um, and he recognised all that himself. Um, but if you want to point to someone and say, that's a life, then my dad's life fits that bill.